Let's get straight into Chantel Talks with the original Yellow Wiggle, Greg Page. Well, firstly, Greg, I wanted to say a massive thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Pleasure. Thank you for having me on. My young self is squealing inside. She's so excited that she gets to talk to the original Yellow Wiggles. So oh, I'm, glad you're, I'm very glad you're excited. <laughs> yes, I am. I even tried to channel my inner wiggle with some blue. Oh, very good. Yeah. I- I'm the black wiggle today. <laughs> I couldn't find yellow. I don't have yellow clothes. So. Nor do I. It, funnily enough, I don't wear yellow much and um, I only wear it when I walk on stage these days. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I thought it would be fun to start off with some rapid fire questions about the Wiggles, things that a lot of people listening probably are really curious about. I know I am. And we can get the inside scoop. Hopefully I know the answers to the questions. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Well, the first question is, where did the name The Wiggles come from? I know that one. Uh, so we had a song on our first CD called Get Ready to Wiggle. And we just thought the idea of kids wiggling was pretty cool. So we called ourselves The Wiggles. And it also kind of, you know, it was like groups like The Beatles, The Rolling Stones. It had the at the start of it. So we, we liked that. And it really did kind of link to that form of dancing that was just pretty nondescript and um non-prescriptive I guess in terms of the way that kids could move and dance to the music that we made yeah even when I hear the word now I just I can dance to it just hearing the word wiggle that's yeah Yeah. that's awesome you redefined the word for everyone the next question is where did the wiggles fingers come from that came from in our early days of touring we used to travel around Australia and we'd have the weekends off. Um, Initially, we didn't. Initially, we worked the whole week and weekends. We did that and nearly killed ourselves. But um, when we had the weekends off, we would spend the weekends in these country towns and we'd watch TV on the weekends. And generally, if the cricket was on, we'd watch the cricket. In the lunch break of the cricket, they showed 10-pin bowling. And that went for like half an hour. There were these two guys from South Australia who would do, uh, they'd do their bowl in the, down the, the alley. And if they got a strike, they would turn around to each other and they would do this, right? Like that. Now, one day we were on stage and Murray had just been off stage dressing up as Dorothy. This was how long ago this was when we played the characters ourselves. So he came back on stage and he went, hey, 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 like this. And he did those fingers. Now, that was different to what the bowlers had done. But we said, after the show, we said, Muzz, what on earth was that that you did? He said, oh, you know, I just thought it'd be fun to do because I saw those bowlers doing this after they got a strike. So I thought I could do that. Anyway, so we started copying what Muzz had done. And then it just became a thing. As it turned out, it gave us something to do with our hands in photographs so that our hands would always be visible in photographs because it was something that was always on your mind. How do you make sure your hands can be seen in photographs so that they can't, so that nobody could ever sort of imply or infer that your hands were a place that they shouldn't be. It was something we were very conscious of. So that came out to to be a very good thing for us in many, many ways. Wow. Yeah. And now that action is so iconic and, and everyone loves the Wiggles fingers. It's funny, like I was watching some sporting thing. I don't know what it was, but I've seen several sporting things with international sports people, and they seem to do this, but I think surely it's not come from us. It must be something else where they've got it from. Um, But certainly it is something that's, you know, very closely associated with the Wiggles now. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's really interesting origin story. Wow. There we go. I had no idea. Another question is about the colours. So how did those colours get allocated? And was that always the colours of the Wiggles, like ever since you guys started no so when we first started uh, like if you were to look up on the internet type in the wiggles first cd or some search term like that you'd see the artwork for our first cd where we didn't have the colored skivvies we had these very brightly garishly colored shirts uh, that was for CD1. So when CD2 came around, our manager said, look, how about you guys change your look for the next CD? And this was, I don't know, maybe the day before our photo shoot for the cover for the CD. And we 
had a bit of a chat about it, and Anthony said, oh, look, we should go with black pants and just bright, solid colours on the top. And I think maybe Muzz said, oh, look, I've, I've got a red skivvy at home. And Jeff said, well, I've got this purple kind of skivvy as well. And I think we might have sort of decided that we should go with skivvies, but they needed to be bright colours. Anthony and I didn't have anything that fit that description, so we went out shopping together, which was probably, that was probably a good thing. As fate would have it, it was a good thing. But at the time, we walked into the store, and I think it was an old Grace, Grace Brothers store that um, used to be around. We walked into the store at Chatswood, and in the menswear department, we could both see a blue skivvy on the back wall. And so we both kind of ran for the blue skivvy. And you can tell who was the faster runner on the day, right? <laughs> so Anthony got to the blue skivvy, but next to it was a yellow skivvy. So that's pretty much exactly how the colours became assigned to who they were assigned to. Murray already had a red skivvy. Jeff had a purple or, in fact, it was a plum sort of coloured one on, the, on that album. And then Anthony got to the blue one. I got the yellow one. But... If anybody goes back and watches some of our early DVDs, you'll see that Anthony sometimes wears green, sometimes wears grey. Um, I think they're the two other colours that he wore most often because sometimes he couldn't find his blue skivvy. In fact, for a long time he couldn't find it and he would just turn up in whatever colour shirt he could find. But there was one video in particular, I can't remember the name of the DVD, but I think the song was... Um, Henry's Underwater Big Band or something like that. So I kind of think it might have been Wake Up Jeff, I think it might have been on that album. Anthony's wearing a grey skivvy because we shot that on a blue screen background, not green screen. We had blue screen and so his blue shirt would have disappeared into the thing. I think I'm remembering that correctly. We may have shot it on a green screen. I can't remember. It gets very confusing. But if you go back and look through the history of Wiggles DVDs, you'll see Anthony in blue, green and grey. And that will depend on what shirt he had that day and what background we might have been shooting on. Wow, how interesting. Maybe he just didn't get to washing it fast enough and he was blaming it on not happy. Yeah, can't, he can't find it. Oh, that's awesome. It got blamed on a number of things, but I think at the end of the day, it was what it was. And I think that was part of the beauty of the Wiggles, that it, it was this sort of, um, you know, it wasn't a strictly enforced kind of thing. It was just free. And at the essence of it, though, was the core values of the audience was what mattered most. You know, it didn't matter what shirt we were wearing. What mattered was what we were doing for the audience and how we were engaging with them. And it's one of those quirky things now that we look back on, you know, with the hindsight of, of time and we can see the evolution of this thing that was not well thought out from day one. And I think that's the thing that probably blows a lot of people away, that we were so successful, but a lot of it was just... Uh, I was going to say luck. It wasn't luck, but it just happened because of pure intentions and a desire to do something that was good. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing to hear. I can't wait to dig into that a bit later. But you're so right. I mean, you guys made the decision for your outfits the day before shooting photos. So, uh, yeah, and now they're the iconic colours. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm. It's so funny, yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I wanted to know what your favourite Wiggles song is. That's a tough one. I've got quite a few. I guess one of my favourites is Rockabye Your Bear because that's I think that was the first song that I ever wrote or co-wrote with the Wiggles and was on our first CD. And it's a song that has always been a, a favourite with crowds year after year. Um, another one I love is Can You Point Your Fingers and Do the Twist? It's another one that I had a hand in writing, um, but I, I just think it's a great song to, to groove to. It's got a really good feel. And so when I talk about it being a great song, it's not um, the fact that I wrote it. It's, it's the way that the band played it when we recorded it and the groove that was set up. And, you know, I listened to Jeff playing his organ in that song. There's some incredible organ playing in it. Um, but, yeah, when you get on stage and you perform it with a crowd of people doing it, it's like hot potato, you know, everybody's doing the actions, everybody's pointing their fingers and doing the twist. It's just such a great feeling and, yeah, it's got a great musical backbone to it as well. Yeah. Oh, all the songs do. Even to this day, whenever I hear them, I feel like those emotions 
come rushing back and they just put me in such a good mood. What, what's your favourite song? Well, the song that I've been having stuck in my head the past few days, because I've been researching for the interview, yeah. and even all night last night, I couldn't get it out of my head, and it was Toot Toot Chugga Chugga Big Red Car. It's a great song, yeah. It's a great one. A it's, it's so catchy too. Also, I like fruit salad, I'd say. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, but all of them. There's too many to pick, yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now there, there are there's heaps, and that's the things that Toot Toot is another of my favourite songs. I love singing that song. I think it's it's great fun, and when you go out on stage in the big red car, it's just so cool. <laughs> I know. And the last question, because that has definitely not been as rapid as I... No, I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, I love hearing it. It's great. The last question, who is someone huge that you found out was a fan of the Wiggles and you just thought, oh, my gosh, this is so epic. They know who we are. Plenty of people, yeah, like Jerry Seinfeld, Robert De Niro, Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac, John Fogarty from Credence Clearwater. Um, yeah, some incredible people. Um too many to, to name all of them. Ricky Lake, uh, she was a big talk show host in the US. Uh, yeah, we had some big people come along and want to meet the Wiggles and it just blew us away. So we've been very privileged over the years to have met these people and to, um, you know, hear their stories about their kids watching the Wiggles. Um, uh, who was another one? Oh, there's, there's heaps. Cameron Mannheim, you know, she's a, a famous US actor. Um, so, yeah, lots and lots of people. Yeah, it was, it was and still is such a special group and it was the soundtrack of my childhood. So, yeah, it's, it's magical. Yeah, look, it's, it's funny because I guess in a lot of ways it was the soundtrack for half of my life as well. You know, at the time when I left, I'd been doing the Wiggles for about 16 years and I've been in the, I started when I was 19, so nearly half of my life, the Wiggles songs were a very big part of who I was. So they're, they're great songs and they bring back a lot of great memories for me and for people your age as well. Well, then I'd love to go into the start of the group and hearing a bit more about how it came to be. It came about really just uh, the way I remember it, over one summer. Uh, I was at university studying teaching with Anthony and Murray. They were two years ahead of me. And I got a call from Anthony saying, Look, why don't we get together and write some songs for kids? I've been doing a lot of listening to play school albums and um, there was a performer from the U- uh, from Canada called Rafi. Um, there was another, uh, Shari Lois and Bram was another act that Anthony had been listening to, a lot of other kids' music, and he just thought that, you know, we could write some songs that were as good as those or, um, you know, try to aspire to be as good as those, and we should get together, write them and record them. So that's pretty much how it started. It started very loosely and without any kind of, goal in mind other than writing good quality songs for children but we were very passionate about it and as I said Anthony had done his research he'd been listening to a lot of stuff we'd been learning about children and how they how they think and how you can educate kids by engaging them with with experiences so that really informed a lot of our songwriting and we did that first CD Uh, we recorded at a few different recording sessions but we got there and um submitted it to the ABC and they loved it and they released it as it was. We were really thinking it would just be a demo record. You know, back in the day, people would do demos of songs and submit them and try to get the funding to do a better recording of it. Well, the ABC loved what we'd done and, yeah, that the rest, as they say, is history. Wow. So how did Jeff come to be in the group? He wasn't originally part of the group. There was Anthony, Murray, myself and a guy called Philip. Philip Wilcher and Philip worked at the university where we were studying. So we were in the studio and we'd really taken an old Cockroaches song that Anthony and Jeff were in this group called The Cockroaches. And I was was a big fan of that group. And that's how my journey began with Anthony and Jeff um, that drew, drew us together. But because of this song, we adapted it to what is now known as Dorothy the Dinosaur. And that was on our first CD. It had a bit of a a sort of rock and roll feel to it, but we didn't have a drummer. We didn't have a band as such. And Anthony said to Jeff, can you program, I'm using old terminology here, but can you program us a MIDI sequence from your keyboard that we can use to record this song? Jeffrey said, oh, how long is it going to take? And Anthony said, oh, look, probably an hour or two. So Jeff 
threw his keyboard in the car, came down to the recording studio, programmed in this backing sequence for this song, and we recorded it. But we found out that we really needed a few more of those kinds of songs and that it might be useful to have Jeff as part of the group. So we ended up asking Fatty to, to stay and be a part of the group. So his question about how long was it going to take, he never expected it was going to be, you know, 20 years or whatever it ended up being for him. Um, it was really just a one-off thing for him to come to the studio and record those songs, but he ended up staying and was an invaluable part of the group. Yeah. Oh, that's so fascinating. Did you always have a love for music that you thought it was potentially something you wanted to pursue? Yeah, always, yep. Yeah. I always felt drawn to music and I always kind of felt drawn to doing something that would have some kind of impact with music. So I guess I had this innate knowing from a very young age but didn't know what it was going to be but always felt drawn to doing music in a big way and being on the stage and performing. And it's incredible that you, as you said, all of you, the three of you studying early education were able to use that knowledge to make your your content more educational and engaging, which is phenomenal. Yeah, that's so incredible to hear. Did you guys, even when the Wiggles grew bigger, were you able to use your knowledge to create skits and enforce ideas and stuff like that? Or did it kind of get, I don't know, did you have less control over the ideas? No, we always made, we, well, I was going to say we always maintained control. We didn't always, we had to give up control a couple of times, but whenever we had control, we would always try and ensure that we stayed true to those foundations and those principles. And whenever we did stay true to those, we found that things worked really well. From time to time, we would try things that deviated a little bit from those principles. Um, whether it was out, I don't know. Anthony's very spontaneous, which is great. And I remember being on stage one time, we were on tour, and a lot of the, I, I guess, doing so many shows day in, day out, three or four shows a day, five, six, sometimes seven days a week, could become a little bit um, repetitive for us. But having said that, the audience was always different. So a different audience for every show meant that every show was different. However, for us, doing the same content over and over could become a little bit repetitive. So Anthony would throw in these things. He'd just try them without even discussing them with us on stage. He just, I remember he threw in this thing, I think he called it Question Time with Dorothy. So we'd have Dorothy the Dinosaur on stage and we had somebody on tour with us who was doing the voice live. And so Anthony said, okay, everybody, if you've got a question for Dorothy, put up your hand and you can ask a question to Dorothy. So all these kids would put up their hands and Anthony would say, yep, what's your question? And they'd say, I'm three. And then Anthony would say, you're three. Well, that's not really a question, but, you know, it's great to hear that you're three. Now, what's your question? I've got a sister, right? So what was happening was kids were not asking questions. They were telling us information. And so we tried that for about a week, I think, before Anthony kind of went, what is going on here? Why is this segment not working? We got in touch with one of our lecturers from university and we asked her why this was not working. She said, it's very simple why it's not working. Number one, children don't really have a concept of what a question is. So they don't know to ask a question. Secondly, if they've got, if they've got the chance to talk to Dorothy, being an egocentric child, they don't want to know about Dorothy. They want to tell Dorothy about themselves. So they're going to make a statement about themselves. So we changed that from question time with Dorothy to, you know, tell Dorothy about yourself. And it was a much better experience. So we, there would be, that's just one example of how we would try to change things to make more of a show of things right? But sometimes because of the way we were doing these things, we weren't thinking them through because it was spur of the moment spontaneous. When we go back and think about it, then we would think, okay, why is this not working? And we'd have to tweak things and change it. So we would always go back to that early childhood philosophy to try to make sure that what we were doing was going to connect with the kids in the best way. And when you're in the audience, obviously children and parents, you don't realise the extent of the research and education behind behind the songs or 
yeah. or the skids no, or anything. But people wouldn't because a lot of people just think, oh, it's so easy to entertain kids. You just get up there and jump around and have fun, which is kind of true. You've got to have that fun element, but you've also got to have the, the foundation very much rooted in early childhood psychology because if you don't know how to tap into the mind of a child and really engage them, then you're not going to be able to do that. And I think, well, I can say pretty safely that the fact that the Wiggles are still going 30 years on shows that, number one, they're still doing it, number two, that they've been doing it the whole time, you know, notwithstanding those minor failures that might have occurred. But that's how you learn and you keep growing because there was a fair bit of pressure to really keep things different and change things up. You know, there's only so many songs you can write about Dorothy the Dinosaur or Wags the Dog before you start repeating yourself. So you had to find new ways of doing a new Dorothy song, a new Wag song, a new Captain song, a new Henry song for every album that you put out. And some of those albums might have had two songs about Dorothy. So you've got to really reinvent yourself every time you do something every year. Yeah. And it, of course, worked very well. Yeah, luckily, yeah. We were very, very lucky in lots of ways because there were so many things that could have gone wrong with the Wiggles, um, you know, with that audience. You know, they're not going to put up with rubbish. They're not going to put up with being bored. You're responsible in, in a lot of ways for creating quality content for them, content that their parents feel that they can trust their child with. Yeah, there's a lot of responsibility, but we had a lot of fun with it. And I think the responsibility part, really was alleviated for us in a lot of ways because we had that knowledge and that background in early childhood education. And it's interesting because children are almost the harshest critics because if they're not interested, you'll be able to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you don't keep their attention. They'll turn their back on you and start doing something else. So, yeah, we were very, very lucky to have many, many concerts where we had fully engaged, you know, the majority of kids were fully engaged in the show. Every child's an individual and we didn't always capture them them all. Not every child was a a Wiggles fan, but those who were, if they came along to a show, you'd see 90% of the audience jumping along to monkey dance or doing hot potato or whatever it might be. Mm. I know I've been to a couple of Wiggles concerts myself and I tried to get photos from my mum and we couldn't find any. I was like, mum, come on, I want to show him. (laughs) You didn't take enough snaps, huh? I know. Well, we, it's so hard to find all those old photos. Like they're in boxes somewhere. So, but we did, I promise. We took a lot of, (laughs) (laughs) a lot of snaps. Well, I'd love to know the process behind preparing for the live shows and the TV episodes as well, because I imagine there's a lot of work behind that and a lot of time commitment and energy as well. Those dance, there's a lot of movement, high energy movement that, that would not be easy. Yeah, look, it's really quite interesting. Some of the stuff there was more time put into than others. I think the live shows, it became so familiar for us. Like it just was like riding a bike. So we we would tour a lot and we would basically tour all year round. So the Wiggles are a pretty unique group in the sense that they've never really had a break from touring. I reckon COVID's been the first time that you would say that the Wiggles have not toured. Every other group in the world, the Rolling Stones, every other act, Pink, Britney Spears, whoever it might be, Justin Timberlake, they'll do a tour and their tour is for a specific length of time. That's their world tour or whatever and they'll stop. It might be two years, it might be three years, but they'll stop and have a break for a year, for two years, whatever. The Wiggles never, ever did that. The Wiggles were always touring. Our break would be a month or two at the most. So doing shows, it was really just a matter of getting back on the bike and saying, okay, well, how are we going to change the show this point in time? So we would have tours, we'd call them different names, but it was not like we had a year or two in between to kind of think about the next tour. It was very much a matter of, well, we've got another year coming up where we're going to be touring. What are we going to do differently in this show? What set are we going to change? You know, how are we going to change the set on stage? What songs are we going to change? What cast are we going to use? A lot of those decisions wouldn't be made until like a week before the tour or sometimes the day before the tour. We'd change the set list the day before. So it was a lot of work, but it wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of time preparing like a lot of acts would do because we were just in the flow of doing it all the time. We were just always touring, always on stage, 
it was just a matter of slotting different things in and swapping things out. So that's how we would basically prepare for the tours. The TV shows were a bit different. Of course, they did take a lot more preparation and a lot more sort of forward planning. But again, a lot of the time it would be, you know, the, the tour would finish. We've got the TV series booked in to be filmed, let's say, in February. So we'd finish touring in December. We'd have January off because a lot of us had kids at the time and we'd spend time with them over the school holidays. TV would start filming in February. And so it was really just a matter of have the script at home, learn the script, get to the studio the day before, rehearse a few scenes and then go for it. That, that was pretty much it. Um, a lot of the planning would be done by the crew who would you know, plan all the logistics of the shoot days and the props and everything that were needed. But, yeah, there was little time for preparing for things like a lot of people usually would do in, in this industry. That sounds like a huge commitment, not just a work commitment, but a life commitment to the group. It, it really was, you know, because when we weren't touring, we were meeting or we were doing promo, we were doing recording. A lot of the albums that we recorded, you know, we wouldn't have material written before we got into the studio to record. So we'd write the songs in the studio, you know, just out of necessity. We knew we had to deliver an album. So we'd think, okay, we might have some ideas of some songs we might do, but nothing was sort of written very firmly or um, concretely before we hit the studio and had to deliver the album. So, yeah, we'd spend two weeks in the studio generally, I guess. The first few days we'd sit and write. We'd record the beds for the tracks and then finish them off. And if we had to write any more songs, then we'd write at the end and finish those off then. But, yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it was a very, uh, very unique way of working, but it, it worked for us. Mm. How were you able to balance other areas of your life, like your health or your, your family? Yeah, it was a challenge. It, it was a challenging thing to do because we were away from home so often. We were not with our families for probably 90% of the year, I reckon. But we had that, you know, maybe not 90%, maybe 80% of the year. We'd be travelling and touring. Sometimes they'd come on tour with us. We'd always have that six-week break over Christmas um, at home and nothing on them, which was great. So for six weeks, we were always around and home. Um, you know, there was like with any job or anything, there's always positives and there's always negatives. Hopefully um, for, for my kids, the, the positives outweigh the negatives, but, um, you know, you, you've always got to take the good with the bad and you've got to make the most of life in whatever way you can and with whatever's presented to you. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I know they'd be very proud of their dad. I'd be telling everyone, my dad's the yellow wiggle. <laughs> Well, it was just the source of some uh, teasing for my eldest son at the time. He was he was probably in year six or something when the Wiggles were, were hitting their peak. And so, you know, to be in year six and have a dad who's a Wiggle is very uncool. Oh, that's such a shame. I was actually going to ask you about that. You were 19 when you joined the Wiggles and when the Wiggles, well, when the Wiggles started. That's a very unconventional career, I guess you could say, for a, a teenage boy. What was your experience like with those around you and the musical group? Was there a lot of support or a lot of... Yeah, look, it, it was just... It just was. Um, there was no judgments by anybody. No, yeah, no, it, it wasn't an issue at all. I think even going into teaching wasn't a problem. Um everybody that I was in contact with at that time was all very supportive of the decisions that I'd made. Of course, I think my parents were a little bit concerned about trying to make a living out of music. And I mean, I wasn't concerned about it. I was certainly aware that you had to be very lucky to be able to make a living out of music. And so that's why I went to university to become a teacher so that I could always have music in my life in some way, you know, in the classroom, bring a guitar into the classroom and sing songs for kids. So I had that to fall back on and I completed my teaching degree. Um, but by the time I finished, the Wiggles were going strongly enough to be able to make the decision to try and make a full-time go of it. And, and we did. And, you know, I look back on all of that and I think, you know, my parents were very much concerned for me moving forward. But once, once it became a viable proposition and it was, you know, it was never a proper job <laughs> because we were self-employed and, and, you know, the thing 
backside could have fallen out of it at any time. But they were very proud of what I was able to do with the other guys and, and we created something that was very unique and historic and, yeah, they're very, very proud. Yeah, for sure. And you did, as you said, you completed your degree. So I guess having something to fall back on if you ever needed to. Yeah. 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 What's your advice then for people listening who have dreams that are unconventional or in things that are more difficult to achieve success in than other areas? What would your advice be for pursuing that? Follow your dream and see where it takes you, you know. Have a, a real-world view of of life. But if you've got a dream, follow that dream and see where it takes you because opp- opportunities will present themselves and, you know, doors will be open, doors will be part open, doors will be closed, and they're there to open. If they're not open, try and open it and see where it takes you to, see what's on the other side. You might not want to go in, you might. You might want to go in wholeheartedly and jump in. But the, the great thing is you can always change where you're going at any time because you have the choice of you've got the power of free will choice to to go down one path or another so i think as as you take each step down the path your view changes right life never looks the same from where you stand or if if it does look the same you're standing still you should be moving at, at every moment in life you should be getting a different perspective on life from things you've seen things you've learned um, experiences you've had, people you've met, they all inform your your knowledge and they empower you to make decisions about where you're going to go. Oh, I love that advice. Thank you. Yeah, follow your dreams. I mean, it kind of sounds like the Wiggles became successful overnight, but that's never the case. It, you know, success requires hard work, as we know. How did the Wiggles become such a worldwide phenomenon? Yeah, well, look, you're right. That part didn't happen overnight. You know, I think uh, it's funny because as you were talking about that, I was thinking about 1991 when we released the album and that, that moment of releasing the album and doing photo shoots and doing performances to promote the album, that seemed like that happened overnight and that was pretty cool. But that was nothing compared to what happened down the track, right? So as, as you go down this path, you have these experiences and you think, wow, this is amazing, this is incredible. You don't know what lies ahead. So as you're doing that, things grow and they become bigger and, yeah, it just snowballed. So I think the US didn't kind of happen for us in the UK. It didn't happen until around about 97. And I think it really took our Wiggles movie for for those markets to open up to us. So in 97 we released this movie i think it was just called the wiggles movie in the us it was called the wiggles magical adventure or something like that but it was released here as a cinema release so it was a real movie in the us it was just released straight to dvd but it was that that really enabled us to capture the attention of people in the us because the movie was released by 20th century fox which is a big movie company so to to go to the us and say look we've had a movie released in Australia by 20th Century Fox was quite a big deal. So it got the attention of people like Fox Family Channel, who are obviously associated to Fox because of the the ownership. Um, So we ended up launching in the US on Fox Family or Fox, might have been called Fox Kids, I can't quite remember. But we're on Fox Family or Fox Kids for maybe a year, maybe two years, I think maybe 1999, we switched over to Disney Channel or Um, Disney Junior, Playhouse Disney it was called at the time. When we switched to Disney, we noticed a huge change in our recognition in the US. Many, many, many more people had Disney Channel than had Fox Kids or Fox Family. So when we were going through customs at the airport, even the customs agents were kind of saying, hey, aren't you guys the Wiggles? You know, my kids watch you guys. It It was really remarkable. I think we had that period of two years from our first appearance. At, I think we did our first thing at Disneyland in 97, might have been 98, I can't remember. Uh, but then going to, to performing there in 99 after we'd been on Disney Channel for even just a few months, really skyrocketed you know, our, our profile in a really positive way. Yeah. Well, that's incredible to hear. Well, then what would you say was your most memorable moment i'm sure you've got so many but one of your most memorable moments in the wiggles yeah too many to to really hone it down to one honestly 
because there's all different ways of classifying most memorable, right? There's, you know, there's moments where you've met children who had a special reason for wanting to meet you, whether they were in hospital or they had special needs or their family was going through something really tough and you could see the impact that you were having on them. And that was so magical to know that you're part of something that had this really powerful effect on a family or a child. That's so memorable. Then there's, you know, just standing on stage at the Sydney Carols in the Domain every Christmas from 1994. I think the Wiggles did every single Carols in the Domain um, in Sydney at Christmas time. And standing on that stage and seeing 120,000 people holding candles or, you know, the vast majority of them you could see down the front dancing along to Go Santa Go or um, Here Come the Reindeer. That's so memorable. So there's you know, meeting Robert De Niro, meeting Jerry Seinfeld, meeting those kinds of people. That's all memorable. Um, the funny things that would happen on stage between us as mates, some of those things were memorable too. So it's just been an incredible journey and an amazing ride and such a, a fantastic thing to have been a part of that forms a big part of my life and who I've been. Yeah, for sure. Those are all amazing to hear and what a what a fulfilling life you've you've lived. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, in 2006, you made the decision to leave the Wiggles. So tell us a little bit about that decision and you know, your choice to prioritize your health and and leave the group behind. Yeah, so that was a really tough decision to make. It was very hard because number one, at that point in time when I made the decision, I didn't know what was wrong with me, which was really part of the reason why I made the decision because I couldn't handle the stress of what I was going through. I was also going through a marriage breakup as well, which was very emotionally distressing. So there was a lot of things I was trying to deal with. Then when I started collapsing on tour, I thought, well, this has got to be something you know pretty bad. I, I really need to make my health a priority right now. So I had to make the decision to leave the group. They had a number of deals that were on the table that they wanted me to be a part of that I couldn't commit to because I didn't know whether I should sign these deals or not. So I made that decision to leave. Ultimately, I got diagnosed with a thing called orthostatic intolerance, which means the inability to stand up or to be in an upright position for a period of time uh, because what would happen was the blood would just pool in my legs. Yeah, got that diagnosed, got it treated with medication. And it, it's also something that emotional stress does have an impact on, but also losing vast amounts of sweat through performing had an impact on it as well because I wasn't able to get enough fluid back into my body no matter how much Gatorade or water I would drink. I just couldn't get rehydrated. And that was the end result was that collapsing because the blood volume in my body was not sufficient for my heart to be or for my legs to be able to pump the blood back up from my legs to my heart. So it's a little bit of a complicated thing, but needless to say, not performing with the wiggles ended up being a part of my rehabilitation and recovery from that state that I was in. Mm. And was it really hard seeing the group go on without you? Yeah, look, it was, but not in any kind of negative way. It was just hard personally um, because it was, something that I loved doing and I I had helped create that and you know that that was my journey but at the same time I think initially it was it was really just a fait accompli that I couldn't do it I was unwell so it was the right decision so as time went on though I guess you know I got a little bit better and I could could do more things but I was doing other things then so it wasn't really I guess put it this way there was never really a consciousness of lack in my life. Like I wasn't really feeling that lack. Um, The guys ultimately asked me to go back in 2012 to replace Sam because he was leaving at the end of 2011. And that that was a tough decision because I had to really think about why I was doing that, you know. Was I doing it to help them out or was I doing it for my own purposes? And I think there was a lot of unresolved stuff there for me because I left the Wiggles, I left a tour in the US to come back home and get checked out. And so I I never knew that that last show that I did in the US was my last show. So I think for me, there was that kind of element of, you know, some putting some finality on it. Uh, The whole thing went down really badly, though, with, with Sam leaving and me coming back in. There was a lot of people that thought that 
he got the boot so that I could come back in and a lot of, lot of bad publicity. And that was really the first lot of negative publicity that the Wiggles had ever had. And it was really badly managed. So it, it wasn't a great time of my life, unfortunately. It wasn't sort of the return to the group that it should have been because it was never really made clear that Sam wasn't getting the boot. He wasn't getting sacked. You know, he was not renewing his contract. And so the Wiggles had to replace him with someone. It was either going to be me or somebody else, but there was never going to be Sam there in 2012 because he wasn't signing back on. So it was a really bad time. But that year ended up becoming you know, the final year for Murray and Jeff as well because of all that bad publicity. You know, they just sort of looked at everything and thought, well, look, you know what? We've had an incredible career. Right now is probably the time to finish with Greg when he completes his contract. I actually had to, I actually had to stay on a few months. I was supposed to finish in August 2012. Then the guy said, look, if we finish at the end of the year, can you just stay on for another few months and we'll all finish together? And that made sense, right? It made sense that all the four Wiggles should be together when Murray and Jeff leave for good. So, yeah, it, it was a real interesting journey, that one, but it all sort of came back to that time that I was out of the group and that that um, that feeling of wanting that completion or completeness to my journey with the Wiggles. It's such a shame, though, that that really special time where you all got to finish together was tainted by the yeah. media and I guess it's a testament that you can't believe everything you read online yeah it was uh, like I said it was badly handled for a lot of reasons yeah yeah and then in 2019 you all came back for the bushfire relief concert 2020 January 20. 2020 ah oh, 2020 2020 yeah. COVID has just like 2020 for me. Yeah, wow, yeah. 2020. I thought it was, yeah, okay. Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, 2020. Tell us a little bit about that night and what happened and I guess how that spurred a new passion and purpose for you. So in January 2020, the original Wiggles decided to get together to do a fundraiser for some of the bushfires that had been through Australia in 2019 into 2020. Um, and we'd done a couple of these reunion shows before for people like you who grew up with the Wiggles and wanted to see the original guys back on stage again. And those ones that we did, I think the first one was 2016 and then we might have done one 2017, but they were really successful. They were a lot of fun for us and a lot of fun for all the kids that came along. So we did one in, in January 2020. We actually had two scheduled to perform because the first one sold out so quickly, it sold out in like eight seconds or something stupid like that. So we did the first show on that night, on the Friday night, the 17th of January. I got through the whole show, got to the end of the show, and then I collapsed. Now, that I don't, I don't remember much about the show at all. I do remember collapsing. I remember rolling onto my back and feeling very unwell and out of breath, but I thought it was just because I'd done a big show with the guys and I was probably a little bit older than I was before and maybe a little bit out of condition. But what had happened was that I'd had a massive heart attack and my one of my major arteries in my heart had become blocked with a little bit of plaque that had broken off through the show and had clotted this artery. And that sent my heart into cardiac arrest. So two different things, heart attack and cardiac arrest, two different events, but one can lead to the other as it did in my case. So when I was lying on my back there and trying to breathe, I now know that I was going into cardiac arrest and my heart was stopping. My breathing was stopping and had it not been for people that were around me, recognising the fact that I was not breathing, uh, I might not have survived because when someone's in cardiac arrest, unless you can co correctly diagnose that they're not breathing, which sometimes can be hard, right? Um, yes, they called triple zero, but they also started CPR straight away and that made a big difference to my survivability but also a positive outcome once I did survive in terms of neurological outcomes and, and physical outcomes because when the brain's without oxygen for a period of time you can get brain damage starting after say three minutes so that's why I'm saying being able to identify correctly somebody who's not breathing is so important because you've only got about three minutes to really get that blood flowing manually with compressions to the brain so that it doesn't die off and, and start to be damaged 
The other thing that was important in my resuscitation was an AED. And uh, I know I've got a very messy office here at the moment, but that's because I'm working hard on a charity called Heart of the Nation, which is all about raising awareness about this very matter. And you can see a whole stack of AEDs there waiting to go out to um, a council in regional New South Wales where we're working with them to get AEDs to be made publicly accessible because 80% of cardiac arrests happen in the home. So for me, having the chain of survival put into play by these bystanders is the reason I survived. You know, they called triple zero, that's call. They pushed on my chest with CPR, that's push. So call, push and shock. They used an AED to shock my heart and bring me back to life. So the the startling thing that I found out when I woke up in hospital is that only 10% of people survive a sudden cardiac arrest. And one of the reasons for that is because they don't have that AED there. That's not available to many, many people that have a cardiac arrest in the community. Only 2% of people that have a cardiac arrest get community defibrillation before an ambulance arrives. So I just rambled on there for a long time in answer to your question about what happened at the bushfire concert, but that's essentially it. I had a heart attack that led to a cardiac arrest and but for those bystanders who could call, push, shock, I would not be here today. And it's so scary to think that if you don't have the right people around or people who don't know CPR or you don't have access to an AED, that that's the end when, when there's potential to be able to save your life with the right equipment. That's the thing. That's the shocking thing that I, and that's why I do what I do now with Heart of the Nation, because I, I firmly believe that we can save a lot more lives with more people understanding about CPR and more people having access to these devices. Because we know from studies around the world that when one of those AEDs is placed on someone who's in cardiac arrest within three to five minutes, their chance of survival is between 60 to 75%. So if you can get it on them quickly, we're going to see a massive increase in survival rates. Now, we can't save everybody, so we can't say, oh, well, if everybody knows how to use the chain of survival, we can save 23,000 or 27,000 people every year. We can't. But I reckon we can save at least 3,000 more people, all right? But if we get more and more of these devices out in the community, that that 3,000 will become 4,000, 5,000, maybe even six or 7,000 people that we can save every year. And that's phenomenal. You know, you think about an additional 5,000 families who don't lose a loved one every year. That's, you know, that's 5,000 more families like mine who got me back. And, you know, I just still think about the day I left here and took for granted that I'd be coming home that night. And I didn't come home that night, but I did get to come home. And for 90% of people who have a sudden cardiac arrest, they don't go home. That's, That's so scary and so sad. For a lot of people listening who feel really touched by your story and also hearing the effectiveness of AEDs, what can we do to help? Well, you can learn CPR for a start. So you can get formal training with a registered training organisation like the Red Cross or like Surf Life Saving New South Wales. They're great supporters of Heart of the Nation, so I'll always put them forward. But you don't have to be trained in CPR to give it a go. Any attempt at resuscitation is better than none. And so one initiative that we're doing with Heart of the Nation, we did it last year as a live stream event on the internet, on YouTube. This year, I'm really proud to say that Channel 9 are doing a national broadcast of the world's largest CPR class. So we showed them what we did last year on YouTube and they said, you know what, this is great. This is a simple message, but it's a positive message. It's an empowering message that you don't have to be trained in CPR to try and save somebody's life. You don't need to be qualified or trained to use an AED to use it and try to save somebody's life. So the world's largest CPR class is going to go to air on the 16th of October. So I hope this gets out there before the 16th of October. And we can share that with people and let them know that they can tune in because any attempt at resuscitation is better than none. So if you can tune in and watch this, you'll learn a little bit about CPR, but it will be enough to give you the confidence and empower you to try and save somebody's life if you ever need to. Oh, that's exciting. This will definitely be up before then. But no, that's wonderful to hear that Channel 9 is getting on board as well. Yeah, I hope everyone listening. It's massive. It's a one-hour national TV broadcast. So it's, it's great exposure for the message, but it's great exposure for Heart of the Nation too, because we've got 
many other initiatives that we do that a lot of people wouldn't know about. So we have, um, we'll be launching a CPR pushathon as well. So I can talk about that now. Uh, we haven't officially launched it yet, but you can check it out. If you go to cpr-pushathon.raisley.com, so it's a Raisley fundraising website, or if you go to heartofthenation.com.au, you can find out more about it there. But we're asking people to form a team, get sponsored, sign up and start pushing. That's all you got to do. And you can push on a pillow or a soft toy or a football, a soccer ball, anything that provides a bit of resistance to being pushed on and see how long your team can push for. But raise money for Heart of the Nation and restart a heart day at the same time. So, again, it's an interactive, engaging experience that will immerse people in this knowledge about CPR because you don't have to do the formal training. Of course, doing the formal training will help you have more confidence, but anyone can have a go at doing CPR if it's needed to be done. Oh, that's great. Participating in that, being able to learn how to do CPR if need be. And I I think that's a really good point because I personally didn't know that, that any, any effort with CPR counts. Absolutely. Because you know why? The person who needs CPR, they can't get any worse than what they are. So anything you do in terms of trying CPR is going to only help them. If you do nothing, the only positive, the only possible outcome is that they will die. We know that for a fact. If nothing is done, that patient will die. If you try something, they have a chance at living and you would be the reason why they have that chance. Wouldn't you rather be the person that gives someone the chance at life rather than letting them die? People need to understand this. You can't hurt them by doing CPR. You can't make them worse off. You can only save them. And that's a really powerful thing. Mm, Definitely. That's that has empowered me to go and want to learn and sign up for the pushathon. Yeah. I'm sure right. everyone, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sure get, everyone get listening. Get the team, get everyone to sign up and have some fun learning CPR and learning what to do in, in case somebody collapses in front of you and they're not responding and not breathing. Yeah, and is there anything people can do on an individual level to try and get more EADs in venues and facilities? Yeah, look, I think you know. For anyone to become an advocate, I mean, the other initiative that we have is this one here. So if you know somewhere that has an AED, get them to sign up to Heart of the Nation. It's free to become a member. And we send them these stickers to put on the window or doors at the front of their business because often the AED is stuck out the back somewhere. It's in the lunchroom or a staff room or a maintenance cupboard somewhere and people don't know it's there. But if people see this sign and someone goes into cardiac arrest nearby, they'll know that there's an AED inside that business that they can go and get, and that might just save somebody's life. So that's a really important initiative too. So, yeah, on an individual level, spreading the message about what Heart of the Nation stands for is really important too because the more locations that we have that people can identify, the more lives that can be saved. Oh, it's so great to see that you've used this really hard experience and, you know, the struggles that you face with your health to found this charity and help save more lives. That's incredible. Well, you know, when I woke up in hospital and saw my story on the news, I think that's when I knew that I had to use it. You know, combining that with the fact I'd found out that only one in 10 survive, I knew I had to try and get as much attention on this subject as possible because it's something I didn't know about beforehand, even though my wife's a cardiac nurse. I didn't really understand that people can just drop dead in public or at home or wherever, you know, I certainly knew about heart attacks. I knew knew what that term was, but I didn't really understand what a cardiac arrest was. And now I do. And now I know there's an intervention that can be made by people. We just need more people to be able to do it. Yeah. And for people listening who hear this and are scared or frightened that it could just happen at any moment, is there warning signs for you? Did you experience any warning signs that I guess we're a telltale sign that potentially something was coming. No, sadly not for me, there wasn't. For some people there are, and and for those people, that's the heart attack. That's the heart attack warning signs that they'll get. So they will get pain in the chest, they'll get short of breath, they'll start to feel unwell. That's when you call triple zero. Don't wait till you've collapsed for somebody to call triple zero. As soon as you start to feel unwell, short of breath, pain in the chest, pain in the jaw, pain in the neck like that, you should call triple zero and and just get somebody on the way. Um, No, but for me and for a lot of people who have a sudden cardiac arrest, there's no warning. 
that word sudden is there for a reason. It just happens totally out of the blue. Some people will experience a sudden cardiac arrest playing sport on a marathon run, riding a bike, and there is literally no warning. So earlier this year, there was a high-profile cardiac arrest on a soccer field in, in Europe. It was part of a big competition over there. A young guy, I think he's 28 years old, he collapsed on the field, no warning, but he went into cardiac arrest and he needed to be resuscitated. So luckily for him, being a pro footballer, there were people around who knew CPR and they had an AED right there. For a lot of other people who are playing cricket or playing football, playing soccer, if they go into cardiac arrest, it's a real surprise to their teammates and they're not prepared necessarily to respond appropriately. So that's another reason why the survival rate is so low because you know, you're playing sport, you think you're fit and healthy, then somebody goes down. Cardiac arrest is not really on the front of the mind for people. They think, oh, are they dehydrated? Are they fainted? Is it a fit? Have they gone into a seizure? So you go through all these other thought processes before you kind of arrive at, oh, I think they're in cardiac arrest and need CPR. So it does happen more often than people might think. Um, 27,000 Australians every year suffer a sudden cardiac arrest. The majority of those will be older people, but we have ambassadors for Heart of the Nation who are young people, a 24-year-old, 28-year-old, sports people, fit, healthy people, but they can still go into cardiac arrest. So it's something you shouldn't be afraid of um, because the incidence rate is one in a thousand, but it can happen. And the best thing to do is to educate yourself and your friends and your family on what to do if somebody goes into cardiac arrest just in case. I read that one in five people that suffer a heart attack are under the age of 40. That's probably right. So for people listening who are in their 20s and 30s, is there any advice you have for living a healthier lifestyle when you're younger so that you can, obviously, as you said, these are healthy, fit people that are suffering from sudden cardiac arrests, but are there things we can put in place whilst you're young, to try and lower the risk of certain heart diseases or yeah, other Absolutely. struggles? Yeah, look, I think, you know, we, we know there's a lot of risk factors and they talk about the risk factors. So don't smoke. Yeah, diabetes is another risk factor. Fat, foods that are high in fatty content, you know, will lead to high cholesterol. So get all of those things checked out. Now, for me, those risk factors weren't sort of there. I had had a bad diet years before. So that period of time when I was on tour with the Wiggles, it wasn't always easy to, to eat healthily. So you just eat whatever you could and a lot of other reasons. But for those younger people, it's not only heart disease and heart attacks that can cause cardiac arrest. It can be genetic conditions. And the first time that somebody might know that they've got one of these genetic conditions is when they drop to the floor. So there's screening that can be done. So if you think you might be predisposed for some reason, if you feel a funny thing in your chest, go and see a doctor. But live a healthy lifestyle too. You know, eat good food. I've cut a lot of crap food out of my diet since my event last year because stupidly I thought that being fit or being physically active would counteract some of that crappy food. So I've cut out bacon, sausages. I eat very little cheese now. I used to have cheese on things. Um, what else have I cut out? I've cut out a lot of that sort of fatty kind of stuff. I eat more of the healthier kind of things. But if you can do that sooner rather than later, it's always a good thing, right? You don't want to have to, you don't want to be one of those people lying on the floor waiting to see if somebody can resuscitate you to find out that you need to change your diet. So do it while you can. Yeah, oh, I love cheese. That'll be a, that'll be a hard, <laughs> yeah. hard one. You know what? I, I haven't found it that hard to change things the milk i use now is milk that's got no cholesterol in it whatsoever and i find that really interesting so it's i think it's paul smarter white i think it's called um yeah i looked that up it's got no cholesterol it's got a little bit of fat in it but no cholesterol so that's great i use that margarine that, that actually helps to lower your cholesterol i use a lot of that low fat yogurt now in place of things like um sour cream if i'm making a, a mexican um uh, what do they call it? guacamole uh, i'll use yogurt instead of that yeah so i think you can make smarter choices um and yeah i think less less of those diabolical things is always a better better thing for you and healthy food tastes good too so it's not like 
it's difficult that you're missing out on swapping out the sour cream for the yogurt, for example. Yeah, look, that's fine. Yeah, I I struggle with healthy food, to be honest, <laughs> and I, I always have, and that's why my diet was so bad before. But now, yeah, it's some of those little changes that you can make that will make an improvement. So it can be done. And as I said, if you can do it before you end up on the floor, it's a much better position to be in. Yes, for sure. No, those are great advice for people listening. We don't often talk about health on this podcast, so that's really helpful. You probably don't often talk about a lot of these things on your podcast. (laughs) We don't often talk about the wiggles, oddly enough. (laughs) Well, last question is, I, I always like to ask my guests this question, but it is, if you could go back in time and give your younger self some advice or people listening who are just entering their early careers, what advice would you like to share, whether that be career-wise or life or health? Um, I I think the biggest bit of advice would just be be happy with who you are. You don't have to please anyone. You don't have to do things to please others. You're enough. That's it. That's all I would say. (laughs) Make of that what you will, but, you know, it's it's so true. You, You are enough. You don't have to change. You don't have to do things to please others. People can accept you for who who you are. And if they don't, there's plenty of people who will. Yeah, and I think that's something I've learned as well is that people, you could be doing nothing or you could be doing everything and there's always going to be people who just don't agree with you or like what you stand for and that's okay. Yep, absolutely. Mm. Well, Greg, that is the end of the interview. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It was so surreal getting to hear about the wiggles and thank you for sharing honestly your health experiences and struggles it's been my pleasure thank you so much for having me on